Soho, always the key to mod. For the music, for the fashion, for the excitement. Berwick Street Market, a street synonymous with three totally different things. Sex, fruit and records. This is where the mods came to get their imported records from America, Black America specifically. The record shops have long gone, the fruit market's just about hanging on, but sex is certainly still here. Testing, microphone check on one, two. Tell me what you're gonna do. One of the main mod icons is the motor scooter. Now there's two main types. I'm sitting on a 1964 Lambretta Li150, completely unrestored, but you could also have a Vespa. The reason mods adopted scoot is quite simple. They're sleek lines, they were Italian, and Italian has always had a big influence on, on what mods thought. Best of all, they're cheap, they provide a little bit of protection from the weather. There's no access to moving parts like your engine or a motorbike has all that grease coming out. It's all protected by panels, so it was clean and good for your clothes. It's almost like a sports car on two wheels. You can't make it work. The only other thing is I can push start it and then just... It seemed that the whole world went to Soho for excitement. Prostitutes, pimps, pushers, sailors, airmen, drunks, kids. You could leave your family and come to Soho and you would immediately step into another, albeit dysfunctional family. But it felt like you belonged. Now this place might look like a building site, that's because it is. In fact, it's been a car park for over 40 years, but Ham Yard is the home to the most iconic legendary mod nightclub. It was called The Scene. The place was set up as a rival to the Flamingo by Ronan O'Rahilly in the 1960s. Now this is the entrance to the Temple of Soul and R&B, presided over by Guy Stevens as the first amongst equals of DJs. So let's hope that Guy Stevens' ghost lives on in this building, because we ain't going to see inside. We find ourselves in Carnaby Street, the street most synonymous with the mod movement. It was originally established by a flamboyant Scottish clothes designer called John Stephen back in 1961. Outlandish in that he designed clothes almost exclusively for homosexuals. Don't forget homosexuality was still illegal in London at that time, so this place became slightly out there. But it wasn't long before the mods worked out that John Stephen designed the best clothes in London. Pink hipsters, anybody? Tangerine jeans? The mainstay of the mod wardrobe ever since the late 1950s has been the suit. Now, the suit's been through many different styles over the years, but what's crystallised seems to be the single-breasted three-button. There's a way of wearing it, and it's to do with how you do your buttons up. It's quite simple. Always, sometimes, never. Sausage dog, silly dog, should have put it in his pocket. It's not a real dog. Now we're in Marshall Street, which runs parallel to Carnaby Street. I've come here to find out exactly what it is about suits and tailoring that is so important to mods. And to do that, I've come to meet a bit of a legend. His name is Mark Powell, and he is tailored to the likes of Bradley Wiggins and Paul Weller. What is it about mods and their suits? Well, the whole thing, really, I mean, the old will very strong influence initially was from two key things. It was from Italian style, which was becoming the shorter jacket with a slimmer trouser. And then, of course, the Ivy League thing, which happened. You know, the, the, and that, of course, a lot of the influence come from people like Miles Davis. Yeah. The mod thing was it was always like a higher aspiration, but you still really wanted to embrace and celebrate being working class. Suddenly, by the 60s, it was all about the working class people having a superior style, and that really evolved from the mod guys. 
Mod is still a constant in our culture and society. Why is it still relevant today and who comes in to ask for, mate, can I have a classic mod suit? Well, the thing is, what's been interesting over the last few years, I've been doing a lot of stuff with Paul Weller and, of course, recently Bradley Wiggins. But what's great about these guys, they've sort of taken it the next level of mod, taking it into this century. There is also that mod period about 66, 67, when they got quite the dandy influence. And that's really been evolving a lot more recently with guys like Paul and Bradley Wiggins coming in, you know. Let's get the purple socks in, though. Do you want to get a little bit of purple from the purple tie? Mark Powell, solo legend. The Maltese ran the streets of Soho back in those days. The Chinese ran South Soho, Gerard Street in Chinatown. You know, Soho had little pockets of danger. The alleys with the little red light and the push bell press here. Now I'm sitting outside another mod institution. This one for a variety of reasons. It's Bar Italia. Now, Bar Italia is so mod, it has its own scooter club, and it's symbolic of all of those classic coffee bars that people came and hung out to in the 1960s. Most importantly, it's opposite my favourite jazz venue, Ronnie Scott's. The mods followed bebop. They followed progressive jazz. Frist Street has long been associated with music. In fact, Mozart wrote his first two concertos in the building opposite me in 1764. Not that I'm saying he was a mod or anything. If it had been 1964, he might have been. However, Ronnie Scott's been the home of modern jazz since as long as anyone can remember in this country. Ronnie Scott's Soho After Dark, it doesn't get much better than this. Soho does still come alive after dark, maybe not in the way that it did in the 1940s and 50s. Everything's been swept under the carpet, but if you look under that carpet, you'll still find the danger and excitement, the music, the jazz, the drugs, the soul, the clothes. You'll still find what made Soho the mod mecca in the world. It's all still there, you just have to know where to look.